Banser, the chariot builder of Babylon, was thoroughly discouraged. From his seat upon the low wall surrounding his property, he gazed sadly at the simple home and work an open workshop in the which stood a partially completed chariot. His wife frequently appeared at the open door. Her furtive glances in his direction reminded him that the meal bag was almost empty and that he should be at work finishing the chariot, hammering and hewing, polishing and painting, stretching the taut leather over the wheel rims, preparing it for delivery so he collected from his wealthy customer. How do I get this to stop? Stop. Nevertheless, his fat and muscular body sat solidly. Nevertheless, his fat, muscular body sat stolidly upon the wall. His slow mind was struggling patiently with the problem for which he could find no answer. The hot tropical sun, so typical of this valley of the Euphrates, Euphrates beat down upon him mercilessly. Beads of perspiration formed upon his brow and trickled down unnoticed to those to lose themselves. I wish this would stop doing that. There we go. How did I do that? I'm sorry, just give me a moment. Don't know why it's doing this. It's like there's something else going on. Alright, so we're at the man who desired gold. I'm gonna do a short intermission and make this the right way because it's uh, having some issues. So yeah, Babylon founded a lot of the uh, a lot of the practices that we practice today with money. This is by George Clayson. This is gonna be much better. Okay, so the man who desired gold. Let me see if this will work this way too. Nope, that is not the case. Okay. And for this, we can get this. Yeah, man. And then... Filters. One moment, ladies and gents. That right there, and this right here. Oh yeah, we're in business now. This is a uh, this is fantastic, fantastic. Click, 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 and click. And close. Here we go. Alright, the man who desired gold. Now we're not going to have problems with those little pop-ups and stuff. Bansir, the chariot builder of Babylon, was thoroughly discouraged. From his seat upon the low wall surrounding his property, he gazed sadly at his temple home or simple home and the open workshop in which stood a partially completed chariot. His wife frequently appeared at the open door. Her furtive glances in his direction reminded him that the meal bag was almost empty and he should be at work finishing the chariot, hammering and, hew and hewing, polishing and painting, stretching the taut leather over the wheel rims, preparing it for delivery so he could collect from his wealthy customer. Nevertheless, his fat, muscular body sat stolidly upon the wall. His slow mind was struggling patiently with the problem for which he could find no answer. The hot tropical sun, so typical of this valley of the Euphrates, beat down upon him mercilessly. Beads of his perspiration formed upon his brow and trickled down unnoticed to lose themselves in the Thai hairy jungle on his chest. Behind his, behind his home towered the high terraced wall surrounding the king's palace. Nearby, cleaving the blue heavens, 
was the painted tower of the Temple of Bell. In the shadow of such grandeur was a simple home and so many others far less neat and well cared for. Babylon was like this, a mixture of grandeur and squalor, of dazzling wealth and direst poverty, crowded together without plan or system within the protecting walls of the city. Behind him he had cared to, he cared to turn and look the noise behind him had he cared to turn and look the noisy chariots of the rich jostled and crowded aside the sandaled tradesmen as well as the barefoot beggars even the rich were forced to t turn into the gutters to clear the way for the long lines of slave water carriers on the kings of business fifteen each bearing a heavy goatskin of water to be poured upon the hanging gardens. Bansir was too engrossed in his own problem to hear or heed the confused hubbub of the busy city. It was expected it's un, it was the unexpected twanging of the strings from a familiar lyre that lied across or that aroused him from his reverie. He turned and looked into the sensitive smiling faces of his best friend Kobe, the music, musician. May the gods bless thee with great liber liberality, my good friend, began Kobe with an elaborate salute. Yet it does not appear they have already been s yet it does appear that they have already been so generous thou needest not to labor. I rejoice with thee in good fortune. More I would even share with thee share it with thee. Pray, from thy purse which must be bulging, else thou wouldst be busy in your shop, extract but two humble shekels and lend them to me, until after the nobleman's feast this night. Thou wilt not miss them ere they are returned. If I did have two shekels, Vansir re responded gloomily, to no one could I lend them, not even to you, my best of friends, for they would be my fortune, my entire fortune. No one lends his entire fortune, not even to his best friend. What? exclaimed Kobe with genuine surprise. Thou hast not one shekel in thy purse, yet sit like a statue upon the wall? Why not complete that chariot? How else canst thou, how else canst thou provide thy noble appetite? Tis not like thee, my friend. Where is thy endless energy? Doth something distress thee? Have the gods brought to thee troubles a torment from the gods it must be bansir agreed it began with a dream a senseless dream in which i had thought i was a man of means from my belt hung a handsome purse heavy with coins they were shekels which i cast with careless freedom from to the beggars there were pieces of silver with which i did buy finery for my wife and whatever i did desire for myself there were pieces of gold which made me feel assured of the future and afraid, unafraid to spend the silver. A glorious feeling of contentment was within me. You would not have known me for thy hard-working friend, nor would it have known my wife so free from wrinkles was her face and shining with happiness. She was again the smiling maiden of our early married days. A pleasant dream indeed, commented Kobe. But why should such pleasant feelings as it aroused turn thee into a glum statue upon the wall? Why indeed? Because when I awoke I remembered how empty was my purse. A feeling of rebellion swept over me. Let us talk it over. For, as the sailors do say, we ride in the same boat. We too. As youngsters we went together to the priests to learn wisdom. As young men we shared each other's ple pleasures. As grown men we have always been close friends. We have been contented with subjects of our kind. We have been satisfied to work long hours and spend our earnings freely. We have earned much coin in the years that have passed. Yet, to know the joys that come from wealth, we must dream about them. Bah! Are we more than dumb sheep? We live in the richest city in all the world. The travelers do say none equals its wealth. It none equals it in wealth. About us is to much display of wealth about us is much display of wealth, but of it we ourselves have not. After half a lifetime of hard labor, thou, my best friend best of friends, has an empty purse and sayest to me, May I borrow such a trifle as two shekels until after the nobleman's feast this night? Then what do I reply? Do I say, Here is my purse, its contents will gladly share? 
No, I admit that my purse is as empty as thine. What is the matter? Why can we not acquire silver and gold more than enough for foods and robes? Consider also our sons, Bansir contender, content, continued. Are they not following the footsteps of their fathers? Need they not? Need they and their families and their sons and their sons' families live all their lives in the midst of such treasure and gold, and yet, like us, be content to banquet upon our sour, go our sour goat's milk and porridge? Never in all the years of our friendship didst thou talk like this before, Bansir. Kobe was puzzled. Never in all those years did I think like this before. From early dawn until darkness stopped me. I have labored to build the finest chariots that any man can make, soft, heartedly hoping some day the gods would recognize my worth, my worthy deeds and bestow upon me the great prosperity. This they have never done. At least I realize this they will never do. Therefore my heart is sad. I wish to be a man of means. I wish to own my lands and cattle, to have fine robes and coins in my purse. I am willing to work for these things with all the strength in my back, with all the skill in my hands, and with all the cunning in my mind. But I wish my labors to be fairly rewarded. What is the matter with us? Again I ask you, why cannot we have just our share of these good things so plentiful for those who have the gold which to buy them? What I knew an answer, Kobe replied, no better than thou am I am, am I satisfied. My earnings from my lyre are qu quickly gone. Often I plan a scheme that my family would be not hungry. Also within my breast is a deep longing for a lyre large enough that it may truly sing the strains of music that surge through my mind. With such an instrument could I make music finer than even a king has heard before. Such a lyre should it's, thou shouldst have. No man in all Babylon could make it sing more sweetly. Could make it sing so sweetly not only the king, but the gods themselves would be delighted. By how mayest thou secure it, what, but how mayest thou secure it, while we both of us are as poor as the king's slaves? Listen to the bell, here they come. He pointed to the long column of half-naked, sweating water bearers plodding laboriously up the narrow street from the river. Five abreast they marched, each bent under a heavy goatskin of water. A fine figure of a man he doth lead them, Kobe indicated, the wearer of a bell who marched in front without a, long, without a, lo, without a load. A prominent man in his own country, tis easy to see. There are many good figures in the line, Vansir agreed. As good men as we, tall blond men from the north, laughing black men from the south, little brown men from the nearer countries, all marching together from the rivers to the gardens, back and forth, day after day, year after year. Not of happiness to look forward to. Beds of straw upon which to sleep, hard grain porridge to eat. Pity poor brutes, Kobe. Or pity the poor brutes, Kobe. Pity them I do, yet thou dost make me see how we little better off are we or yeah yet thou dost make me see how little better off are we free men of though we call ourselves that is the truth kobe unpleasant thought though it be we do not wish to go on year after year living slavish lives working 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 getting nowhere might we not find how others acquires gold such as they do and kobe inquired Perhaps there is some secret we might learn if we but salt from those who knew, Bansir replied thoughtfully. This very day, suggests Kobe, I did pass our old friend Arkad riding in his golden chariot. This I will say, he did not look over my humble head as many as his stations might consider his right. Instead, he did wave his hand that all onlookers might see him paying greetings and bestow his smile of friendship upon Kobe, the musician. He is claimed to be the richest man in all of Babylon, Bansir mused. So rich the king is said to have seeking gold aid in affairs of, tre of the treasury, Kobe replied. So rich, Bansir interrupted, I fear that if, we should, if I should meet him in the darkness of night, I should lay my hands upon his fat wallet. Nonsense, Kobe, reproved Kobe, or Kobe. A man's wealth is not in the purse he carries. A fat purse quickly empties if there be no golden stream to refill it. Arkad has an income.